great lineup for you. We've got a man here whose goal is to bring down the left. His name is Andrew Barry Bart. Yeah. We have John Funk from the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. And we have that, that mama grizzly herself, Sarah Taylor. Yeah. But it's time for us to get this party started. So, I want to invite to the stage Jennifer Mans Marshfield. She's a St. Ambrose Academy graduate. She's working towards her diploma. She plans to pursue a degree in theater. She's going to lead us in our national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh 
Wisconsin State Capitol today. Supporting Scott Walker, Wisconsin, the government, and I'm anxious to hear what Sarah Palin has to say. My name is Jan Peterson. I'm with Fort County Tea Party. I'm the coordinator for the Fort County Tea Party. Why am I here? Because I care very much about our country and about our state. We are completely in debt and it keeps getting deeper and deeper all the time. The American population is taxed to death. They're trouncing on us and I've had it. I'm not going to stand back and, and, and not do anything. That's why I'm here, to make a difference. Excuse me, sir, why aren't you doing your job in Wisconsin today? I'm leaving right now to do my job in Wisconsin. Why didn't you do it earlier today, sir? We believe we did do our job in Wisconsin. But you didn't. You didn't. You, you were supposed to be on the House, to at least be on the House floor to allow them to have a vote, and you didn't do it. Why not? I'm not so sure. That's my job today. My job today is to delay uh, a vote on a piece of legislation the people in the state have said. We have not had time to consider the consequences. What's your, what's your position there, sir, in the Senate? Senator, Let's get What's going. your position get in the going. Senate, this sir? This is my friend from the Tea Party. What's your position so in the Senate, we, sir? We need to uh, get going so we Senator, can... why aren't you in no, Wisconsin doing your job? I was. I was why, there at three why didn't you? I was there at three why didn't you? In the why did you flee the state, sir? Why did you flee the state of Wisconsin so you wouldn't have to do your job, sir? Okay, what's your name, sir? So you guys remember those Wisconsin senators, right? Who knows who George Lopez is? I got this. Right, we got those guys. Uh, call them at the uh, clock tower in up in Rockford. Um, I got a little Facebook message. Told me that they were there. So I'm driving away in my car to get up there really fast. And there's a helicopter circling overhead. I'm thinking a helicopter. There's a helicopter circling over the clock tower. Why? You know, I mean, they got a helicopter already circling this place. I get up there. I see the guys in the parking lot. And uh, I walk up to the guy, and who saw the video? I walk up to the one guy and I said, hey, how come you're not in Wisconsin, you know, fulfilling your constitutional responsibilities? And he said, well, I am doing my, my, my responsibility. And it went back and forth, and you guys kind of know the rest from there. Um, you know, we got this system that works only when everybody agrees to continue to make it work, right? I don't think it works when senators decide they don't want it to work anymore. We got some senators, you saw those guys up here. They're not running away, they're not fleeing. So it only works when we tell when, when we agree to make it work. So those guys had to be held accountable. We sent them back and Governor Walker took over, thank God. You know, who knows who our governor's office is? Our, everybody, if you just turn around and look. Up behind those waving people is the governor's office. That's where our governor is located. I don't know if he's there right now, but I hope he is. 
That's where our governor is right now, folks. Says governor across the top. Who's got a message for him right now? Anybody? His staff is there. Okay? How about this one? Stop the tax. 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 We don't the taxes in this state. You know what? The, the, the state of Illinois gets 20 cents on every gallon of gas. They also charge 10% in sales tax on that gas. Who knew that? Anybody knew that? So they get 20, 20 cents on every gallon and another 10% in sales tax. Then the feds take out how much? 18 cents per gallon. Now if you live in Cook County, they take out another 10%. If you live in Cook County, there's about 90 cents in taxes. Everywhere else in the state, there's probably anywhere from 60 to 70 cents in gas taxes. How many of you folks can afford these gas taxes right now? No. How many can afford gallons of gas right now? No. Okay, here's the deal. So government decides not to participate in the contract that we sent them with. And here's an example of it. Drilling. Barack Obama has refused to allow us to drill. Why? They will drill more. <laughs> okay, so government says you cannot drill in your own in your own place because we want to charge you more for gas. We want to enrich the oil companies. Because if we bought, if we drill here, gas prices would drop significantly. We've got huge oil reserves in South Dakota. They just found 20 billion barrels in Utah. Alaska. Guess what? Government is preventing us from drilling. What that means is they're preventing this contract from being from, from going forward. It, right, they're trading. So if we can't drill, we can't get our own gas. So here's the deal. We all that aside, okay? Government officials stepping on their constitutional responsibilities and it breaks down. Examples of our officials not obeying the Constitution, we've seen everywhere. $14 trillion debt. We pay $800 billion every year in interest. Then we send another couple of hundred billion to oil, uh, uh, terror oil uh, states like Saudi Arabia, Libya, so on and so forth. Government is not fulfilling its contract right now for us, folks. So, we cannot sustain that. We cannot sustain that. But, Americans have allowed this sort of slavery to be created. It is not going to change unless we rise up and change it. Who wants to rise up and change it with me? This is our home. We can't run away to some nice tax-free place. We have to stay here and make this work. Wisconsin senators felt privileged, like privileged heroes. But we know that that's not true. This is our last stand of freedom in the world. We don't stand for that freedom now and today and every day. Freedom everywhere is lost, folks. We're the last stand of that freedom. Our soldiers are overseas spilling their blood right now for our freedom. You know what, I think that we can, we can do a little bit here without blood to maintain that freedom, folks. We and you are descendants of giants. Giants by the name of Hamilton and Je Jefferson and Hancock and Webster. You're descendants of a rugged, risk-taking pioneer class of people, pilgrims, colonists, who threw off the chains of tyranny so that you and I would continue to throw off the chains of tyranny so we can be free and continue to maintain freedom. Our job will never end, folks. Our job will always remain. And if we don't stay diligent to this job, it's going to end, folks. $14 trillion is going to end it. And, folks, history will continue to remember the Tea Party. 
We are the Tea Party. Remember the Tea Party. Thank you, folks. On April 15th, 2009, I came to these very capital steps. Together, as one voice, we gathered here on that day to make our voices heard. But none of us could begin to fathom the enormity of what the Tea Party movement would become. Yes. Nor the ripple effect it would cause to blow from one shining sea to the other. Yeah. 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 October 16th, 1773, a group of strong-willed patriots gathered at the Boston Harbor. They gathered there on that historic night to let their passionate voices ring out across the sea. But they too could not begin to fathom the enormity of what their actions would come to represent. Nor could they foresee the great journey that lay before them. A journey that would become a revolution. A revolution for freedom! are in the midst of a new revolution. A revolution to get our imposing government out of our pocket. Yes. However, this uprising of the people, just like the first, is not for the weak of heart. It requires strength, determination, and perseverance. We can do this. Just look back at the great achievements we have already completed. In the 2010 elections, we proved that we can and will fight for less government, strong values, and lower taxes for all. Yeah. We are proud of these tremendous achievements, but we must not lose the ground that we have just gained. We must run ahead with full force and continue to defend the founding principles of this glorious nation. Yes! Let us celebrate our recent victories and strive to obtain even greater victories for our future. We have only begun to scratch the surface of our full capabilities. Let us join forces with our fellow patriots across the nation and unite in defending our freedom. Yeah. Our founding fathers intended for us to have. Those freedoms included the liberty to pursue the American dream unhindered by an overreaching government. Yeah. Today, the debt in this in this nation and in my future is overwhelming. Thomas Jefferson had this to say regarding debt. I, however, place economy among the first and most important of Republican virtues, and public debt as the, one of the greatest dangers to be feared. Unfortunately, the reality of this strange danger grows bigger every day. Today, 42 cents of every spent federal dollar is borrowed money. Whoa. This enormous amount of borrowed spending must stop here. Yeah. It is imperative that it be extinguished before it suffocates this, our great nation. Thank you. At my current age of 14, I am not yet able to vote and decide how my future paychecks will be spent. So please, protect your children, and my future children, and their future children from having to pay off this titanic debt. We must join together to ensure that the danger of this astronomical burden does not swallow us. This is the time to move. This is the time to call our representatives to stop this excessive spending. Yeah. I ask you to help lift this load of debt off of our nation's shoulders. 
I ask you to not just vote for and give your funds to the right candidates, but to give yourselves. Gather your friends, your fellow patriots, your children, and go door to door. Organize local political events, pray for those in leadership, and get out there and make phone calls for the right candidates. We, the people, have made colossal strides, but we cannot rest on our laurels. Debt, in the least, will limit our future, and at worst, will topple our government. Please, keep passing on the value of financial freedom to your children, and instilling the importance of that freedom in your children. For as Ronald Reagan so wisely said, Freedom is never more than one generation away from its extinction. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. We are now fighting a battle. A battle in which no one is too old or too young to be a soldier. A battle to take back our government. This administration has spent more money than any other government in the history of the world. Do you remember the president when he said he would cut the deficit by half by the end of his first term? Yeah. He quadrupled the annual deficit from 2007. I think his math teacher needs fire. <laughs> Now the president says he will lower the deficit by four trillion dollars. What evidence is there that we can trust him? <laughs> After all, this is the president who will have added 4.4 trillion dollars to our debt in his first three years on the job. <laughs> Y'all remember when the president said he was going to focus on? Jobs like a laser, yeah. and that he wasn't going to rest until Americans were back at work. Well, Mr. President from the Tea Party, you need to take your laser to the shop because it's broken. Yeah. And we ask humbly that you drop out of the vacation of the month club and the country club. Yeah. And please don't ask. The American people to trust you to get four trillion dollars from the deficit when you are the proven biggest spender in the history of the world. Yeah. That's like sending an arsonist to put out the fire. Yeah. Fact number two: This administration has failed to deliver on any of its economic promises. The economy has not recovered, and we are not headed in the right direction. Fact number three, the Tea Party made their presence known in November of 2010. When the Tea Party showed up the polls in 2010, we had the biggest turnover in state houses since 1928.
just like he promised to reduce the deficit before and to create jobs. The only thing we know for certain that he will do is raise taxes. Then the president, who called for more stability and political discourse, launched a partisan political attack upon his opponents with half-truths, insinuation, and false allegations. He is attempting to divide Americans by encouraging class warfare, pitting one group of Americans against the other. He discriminates openly against private citizens based upon their financial status. This is the left strategy for 2012 to demonize, mischaracterize, and to demagogue. We must not allow the left and the media to define the conservative message. It will be up to us to educate our friends and our neighbors to the truth and get them out to vote in 2012. that disagrees with them. I was here in Madison, like James T. said, I caught video of doctor fraud here in Madison. It went viral. It's on Fox News. Bill Hemmer picked it up. S.E. Cup, Megan Kelly, GlennBeck.com, USA Today. The word got out there was doctors committing malpractice here. The left wasn't too happy about that. I came back a couple weeks later to uh, cover the situation for BigGovern.com when they recognized me. Started following me around, stalking and chanting. You know, they knew more information about my life than my friends do. They knew where I lived, how many siblings I had. Yeah, people ask me, are you, are you bothered by liberals knowing so much about you? You, you? you bothered by liberal intimidation? And I tell you, no. No, because no matter where we stand today, or where we want to be tomorrow, I still believe that God is real, America is great. America's great and dreams still come true. My great grandmother came to America on the Titanic in 1912. She survived the sinking. Eventually she came to Wisconsin and she married a man who worked in decades in the quarry with a pick, shovel, and a wheelbarrow. My grandfather, his son, was a mason. My father laid carpet. They decided to become the first college graduate in entire family history. And I'll become the second. I am a farm boy. I come from farms, and I'm not ashamed of that. But I also have other things I enjoy. In between milking cows and shoveling manure, I kept writing, and I kept dreaming. And now I write for the American thinker, biggovernment.com. That's right, Andrew Breitbart's place. BigPeace.com, and I penned a weekly column for the Washington Times. All right. All right. When I was 18, I couldn't write, but my mom stuck with me a year later. I started writing Ashley. How's that for America? Yeah. I was over in England for an international diplomacy meeting. Met with Prime Minister David Cameron and a couple other his cabinet members. And then I went to see the Titanic. I went to see the artifacts of the Titanic. And in this room, they had a big iceberg. And there was mist coming over. You could see the fingerprints in the iceberg. And I thought of my great-grandma. I thought of her. I was like, three generations ago, we were poor immigrants. And now I'm a representative of the country that fulfilled our wildest dreams. Yeah. That's the 
American promise, and that promise still holds today. The left will always oppose us. They'll always attack us. But my friends, they cannot. They will not. They shall never defeat us. Because I'm not the kind of guy to stand by and watch people and things that I love run into the ground. And when I ran for Comptroller, I would go to the Republican meetings and they would say, you have two minutes to speak. And I thought, I have two minutes to tell them how, why I want to be Comptroller, open the books, expose the insider deals, balance the budget, when it took them 20 years to run our state into the ground. But then when I would go to speak to the Tea Party, they didn't put a time limit on it. They said, why are you running for Comptroller? How are you going to balance the budget? They expected me to give details, and then they asked me again, and then they supported me. Thank you, Tea Party. Thank you. 
from. Yeah. Muammar Gaddafi gave $8 million to Louis Farrakhan from the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam headquarters is in Barack Obama's State Senate District. Did any of you know that? Yeah. Let me tell you something. Fool me five million times, shame on me. Fool me five million one times, I, get, I think I got that backwards, oh well. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that $8 million, believe me, uh, can really uh, launch a political career pretty well. And I think it, uh, I think it definitely is going to uh, uh, help ensure Muammar Gaddafi against regime change. Listen, if we're going to turn this thing around, we need a leader. Not a politician, but a leader. If I told you that that leader is here today, would you believe me? Would you, would you recognize that leader? Would you take the next 20 years doubting that leader? Would that leader be quoting Ronald Reagan? Or would that leader, like Ronald Reagan, be living his values? Well, only you can answer that question because that leader is you. That's right. That leader is you because you don't need a poll to tell you right from wrong. need a letterhead activist to tell you what to do about it. Okay? You, the, t the Tea Party, will make that change in this country. I believe that with all my heart. Now, I can just begin my speech. Now, I just want to say one more thing. And that is that we do have a proclamation that uh, somewhere in this, in this room for the R3 referendum to repeal the tax increase, replace it with real tax cuts and reform, yeah. or recall Pat Quinn from the governor's office. Yeah. Good afternoon, fellow Illinoisans. Good afternoon, my fellow Americans. Thank you for having me this afternoon, but more importantly, thank you for collectively saying loudly and clearly, we love America, we believe in America, and we know that with a focused effort by 21st century local, state, and federal leaders, from the grassroots to the General Assembly, we will see the resurgence of a fiscally, socially, and economically strong America for plenty of generations to come. also say thank you to Rhonda Linders and her team for their invitation and support to make it possible for me to be here today. Thanks also to the Northern Illinois Patriots and the Chicago Tea Party for their hospitality at their recent meetings and allowing me to speak there. Now as you know, we come to Springfield, Illinois today gathering together to make a big deal over a big tax hike at a rather paramount moment in time in the history of our state and of our nation. Particularly here in Illinois, it is becoming quite clear that any time a huge tax hike in the land of Lincoln is enough to make a big governor in New Jersey, or should I say a big boned governor in New Jersey, <laughs> any time the big man in New Jersey is making a large plea for Illinois-based businesses to make a grand move from our state to his. Well, folks, you know we have a big problem that we must address immediately with no small delay. Yeah. So we come here today despite the constant slander and slurs thrown out about our movement and against us personally. We come here today to speak above the fray of distractions to reclaim our harmony, the harmony that our nation deserves. I say thank you. Thank you to those that have supported my efforts to take our message to the masses. And thank you to those that have come out to the state capitol today on the path to taking our mission to another level. Even though we have to maintain overcoming 
the distracting false accusations of us being hateful, yeah. us being racist, yeah. us being misguided, and us being misinformed. So today we look to putting America back on the track of prosperity, even as we also set aside those undue criticisms to say loudly and clearly. Some accuse us of being hateful. Well, yes we are hateful, but not in the way that you suggest. See, we hate that special interest groups have dictated to elected officials for decades that the way to make government function is by making government spend more. Even if that means that the people that government represents get less and less with each dollar spent. We hate that politicians are more willing to demonize the conservative movement than they are to defund special interest groups or reduce the inefficiencies of bureaucracy that strangle the breath out of the American dream for working class people that seek to advance themselves and their families through the Great Recession and into our next great era of prominence. As well, we are here to say without equivocation, we seek to inspire revolutionary change for a better future for all Americans. Not a return to the racism of the past that we're accused of, the racism that restricted the potential of all Americans. Our movement understands that with greater efficiency from government and lower in economic inhibitors by government, more Americans can be empowered past their current conditions into the promise of their individual dreams, a vision that supersedes even the economic strangulation given by the recent legislative powers in Springfield bequeathed to the four corners of the land of Lincoln. We understand that smaller government must mean bigger people. And with bigger people come greater people from all walks of life, from all creeds and colors, and with all of them professing the United States of America as their home. of their rights and opportunities afforded by God, yes. not by government. Yes. And we have those great people serving once again that indeed the United States of America is the shining city on a hill for the world to see, just as patriots did before us as they fought on battlefields afar and in the hearts and minds of our fellow countrymen. Now we are here to ask the those that call us misinformed and misguided when we say that our national debt and runaway love affair with spending and taxation and bureaucracy threaten the freedoms that we hold as citizens. We ask them this, explain to us your path to liberating and refreshing sovereignty based on your current trend of doing business in America. But before you answer that question, simply remember this. We have already seen your path. It leads to exploding debt, suffocating bureaucracy, and self-serving government. Months ago. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. Do you know what you just were seeing on the periphery of here and what you're hearing? The death of community organizing. <laughs> let's be honest. Let's be honest, friends. Let's be honest what happened here. Richard Trumka of the AFL CIO has been to the White House about a thousand times and cynically have tried to divide Americans against each other and used Wisconsin to try and pit Americans against each other and the silent majority won. Yeah. I 
saw Mr. Trump at Harvard. I don't, I don't, I can't get into the story how I found myself at Harvard with Trump. And what he did two years ago was say that the Tea Party was racist, that it was violent, that he was scared that, that we were on the precipice of a period like before the John F. Kennedy assassination. How cynical can you get? The Tea Party has been the most peaceful, law-abiding, clean-up-after-themselves group in the history of American protest. by you in the periphery who have lied in getting the uh, doctor's notes you have no right to lecture us on civility. You have no right to lecture us on language. Your coke suckers business. Go to hell. No, Go to hell. Go to hell. You've been so rude. You're trying to divide America. Class warfare is not American. Class warfare is not American. I am here to introduce to you a person who saw this ahead of me, who saw it ahead of everybody. In fact, this lady who's been berated by you because of how effective she is, saw it from her house. She saw it from her doorstep. And she saw that Barack Obama was not a uniter, he was a community divider. Sarah Palin isn't because of her human flaws, it's because how effective she wa is, it's how effective she's been in calling out the community organizer in chief, Barack Obama. Now is the time to bring you the person who's had the courage to stand up to this cynical division. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Palin. But that's not real solidarity. 
Real solidarity means coming together for the common good. This Tea Party is real solidarity.
he would be fiscally responsible. He promised to cut the deficit in half, but President Obama tripled it. Yeah. 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 President Obama promised that fiscal responsibility, but President Obama flushed a trillion dollars down the drain on a useless stimulus package, yeah. and then he bragged about the jobs he created in congressional districts that don't even exist. <laughs> hey, on this White House, you lie. The only thing that trillion dollar travesty stimulated was a debt crisis and a tea party. Yeah. Now the left's irresponsible and radical policies awaken the sleeping America that we understood finally what it was that we were about to lose. We were about to lose the blessings of liberty and prosperity. They caused the working men and women of this country to get up off their sofas, to come down from the deer stand, get out of the duck blind, and hit the streets, come to the town halls, and finally the ballot box. And Tea Party Americans won an electoral victory of historic proportions last November. We the people, we rose up and we decisively rejected the left's big government agenda. We don't want it, we can't afford it, and we are unwilling to pay for it. Less than 90 days after the election, in his State of the Union address, President Obama told us now the era of big government is here to stay and we're going to pay for it whether we want to or not. Yep. Wrong. Instead of reducing spending, they're going to win the future by investing more of your hard-earned money in some cockamamie, hair-brained ideas like more solar shingles, more really fast trains, some things that venture capitalists will tell you are non-starters. We're flat broke, but he thinks these solar shingles and really fast trains will magically save us. So now he's shouting, all aboard his bullet train to bankruptcy. <laughs> With the future, WTF is about right. <laughs> And when Wisconsin's own Paul Ryan presented a plan for fiscal reform, yeah. 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 what was Obama's response? Uh -huh. He demonized the voices of responsibility with class warfare and with fear mongering. And I say personally to our president, hey, parent to parent, Barack Obama, for shame. For you to suggest that the heart of the common sense conservative movement would do anything to harm our esteemed elders, to harm our children with Down syndrome, to harm those who are most in need. No, see, in our book, you prioritize appropriately and those who need the help will get the help. The only way we do that is to be wise and prudent and to budget according to the right priority. The only future that Barack Obama is trying to win is his own re-election. Yeah. He's willing to mortgage your children's future to ensure his own. And that is not the audacity of hope. That's cynicism. Piling more debt onto our children and our grandchildren? It's not courage. No, that's cowardice. But did you notice when he gave that polarizing speech last week, there was a little gem in the speech. Maybe you missed it. But he spoke about the social contract and the social compact. Well, Mr. President, the most basic tenet in that social compact is adhering to the consent of the governed. That would be we the people. Yeah. You didn't have it in November, and you certainly don't have it now. You willfully ignored the will of the American people. You ignored it when you rammed through Obamacare. You ignored it when you drove up the debt to 
a half trillion dollars. Yeah. You ignored it when you misrepresented your deficit spending. Yeah. Yeah. You ignored it when you proposed massive tax increases on the middle class and on our job creators. Yeah. You ignored it when you went to bat for government funded abortions and yet you threw our brave men and women in uniform under the bus, Mr. Yeah. Commander in Chief. Yeah. energy and food prices as you set out to fundamentally transform America, you ignore our concerns and you tell us we just better get used to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. President, we're not going to get used to it. Not now, not never. You ignored us in 2010, but you cannot ignore us in 2012. Yeah. Shame. 
want you. 